This is not the birth control pill for men because, well, there isn't one. It's something we've been hearing is around the corner for a while now. Women, what do you think of this? But it's 2025, so where is it? Since the overturning of Roe vs Wade, discussions around reproductive freedom have been reignited. And it got me thinking, why in 2025 does the burden of birth control still fall entirely on women? What about the men? So over the past few months, I've been digging into this imbalance and I've spoken with doctors and professors to understand what the science says. Is it really just because men couldn't handle the side effects? Well, I went on a journey to understand that the question isn't just why isn't there male birth control yet? It's so much bigger than that. And the answers are more revealing and urgent than I could have ever have imagined. As a doctor, I've seen firsthand how terrible the side effects of female contraception can be. But as a man, I can't even begin to fully appreciate what women have to go through. I noticed acne got worse for me. I started bloating. The that it had on my mental health was actually really terrifying. My mood was psychotic. My cramps were awful. The mental health just plummeted. I would not stop bleeding. And I developed this crazy anxiety and paranoia. It's hard not to demonize female contraception when you hear stories like these. Women have had to put up with these side effects because there's no other option. The alternative is, well, getting pregnant. And today that's not always an option either. The origin of the pill is actually also quite disturbing. In the 1950s, Margaret Sanger, the nurse who developed the first birth control pill, was deeply influenced by eugenics, a movement obsessed with breeding a superior race. This meant targeting people of color, those with disabilities and the poor. But here's where I want to take a moment to be optimistic. The pill's origins are undeniably tied to a symbol of oppression, but it's beautifully poetic today that it stands for the exact opposite. Because when you have contraception, you get choices. You get to choose when you want to have those babies. You get to choose how many babies you want to have. And the development of contraception is the thing that really began that process of liberating women. And that was all part of a bigger movement at the time. Equal rights to have a job, to have respect, to not be viewed as a piece of meat. Beyond this, it's also saved the lives of millions of women. One analysis found that in 2008 alone, contraception prevented over 270,000 maternal deaths worldwide. So really, female contraception is worth celebrating. And I think the focus of this video should be asking how male contraception can build on this progress. So let's start with the current options available to women. But first, quick side note, if you're asking yourself this question, Daddy, where do babies come from? Then simply all you need to know is that women produce an egg, men produce sperm, egg meets sperm, and we get a baby. Any form of effective contraception focuses on stopping that whole process from happening. I spoke with OBGYN Dr. Brooke to help me better understand different parts of the female reproductive system, because even for me, the anatomy is a bit fuzzy. So we start with the vulva, which is the parts on the outside. Then that links to the vagina, which is on the inside. And that's the part that you have sex into. And then above that, you have the cervix, which acts as a gate between the vagina and the womb. So the womb is the part where a baby grows, it's where the lining of the uterus grows and where you shed each month. So that's where your period comes from. At the sides of the womb is the fallopian tubes and this is usually where sperm will meet an egg. They sit close to the ovaries and the ovaries is where you have the eggs. And each month females release one egg and this period is known as ovulation where women are most likely to get pregnant. So there are currently around 10 contraceptive options for females and they focus on doing one of two things. The first is by stopping sperm from actually meeting an egg in the first place. So we've got the barrier methods, those include condoms and they're usually for the males or for the penis owners. And then you've got female condoms, you've got the diaphragm. So those are options that sit right up at the top of the vagina to prevent sperm from entering the uterus. And you also have the copper coil, which changes the environment of the uterus, which makes it more difficult for sperm to survive and reach an egg, as well as surgical sterilization, which is permanent. The other way contraception could work is by stopping an egg from being released completely. This is much harder and requires hormones. Hormones are the body's messengers and travel all around the body to trigger specific actions. The main hormones of the female reproductive system are estrogen and progesterone. They mediate when eggs are released and prepare the body for pregnancy. The way hormonal contraceptives work is you give the body small amounts of these hormones, which tricks the brain into thinking an egg has already been fertilized by a sperm cell and the body's already pregnant. So it stops releasing more eggs. As you can probably imagine, playing around with our body's natural hormones can cause some problems. Some people might notice bloating or water retention, weight gain, 
changes in their skin and irregular patterns to their bleeding. So it depends on which pills you're taking, what hormones they contain and what pattern you're taking those pills over. So the main question is, where are these options for men? Why is there no form of contraception that can stop men from releasing sperm? The physiology of the male and the female is quite different. The female makes one egg, an ovulation during the middle of the menstrual cycle, once a month. Whereas for a male hormonal contraceptive strategy, you're looking to prevent sperm production, which happens millions of times a day. So in reality, is this biological difference that has made producing an effective male contraception so difficult? I spoke with Professor Christina Wang and Dr. Reynolds Wright, leading experts and investigators at the forefront of male contraception, to better understand, given these biological differences, what a male form of contraception could look like we've discovered is that really in order to have good contraceptive efficacy we need to get sperm counts down to less than one million sperm per milliliter of semen and normal sperm concentrations are anything over 15 million sperm per milliliter of semen and we need to get them really low down to less than one million per milliliter. In men this could mean either stopping sperm from being released or actually from being produced in the first place. First there's the hormonal approach. So there's multiple levels at which we could intervene and interrupt that. So to start with, we can kind of hijack that um, hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. Our brain produces a bunch of hormones which tell the male testes to do two things. One is to make the male hormone, the second is to make sperm, right? This is regulated by the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and then the test is. Similarly to how female contraceptive pills work, where hormones are given to trick the body into thinking it's pregnant so it doesn't release any more eggs, we could give men the progesterone hormone to manipulate this process and stop sperm from being produced. The most kind of simplistic way that I put it usually is that the progesterone, the progesterone that is in those drugs, kind of switches off that signaling pathway from the brain down to the testicle, and so sperm production stops. The problem with this approach is that researchers have found giving progesterone in men also stops testosterone production, which can cause a load of dangerous side effects. So low energy, low mood, hot flushes, low sex drive, that kind of thing, which obviously is not desirable. So to overcome this problem, scientists found that giving a combination of both hormones has been most effective. We've really found that combining a progesterone with a testosterone together makes the drug more potent and more effective with then lower doses of both of those hormones. And so part of what is difficult to get right is the ratio of progesterone to testosterone. Too little progesterone means sperm production won't be suppressed enough, but too little replacement testosterone can cause a bunch of side effects. So it's a game of balancing the two. I've seen a lot of stuff online and a persistent myth that the reason a male form of contraception is taking so long is because men are wimps and they just can't handle the side effects. Men almost had their own highly effective birth control, but the medical trial had to stop when some of the men said they couldn't take the side effects. But those side effects were almost identical to what women have been dealing with for decades. A lot of that arose from a study that was published in 2016 um, and was taking place in the kind of five, ten years before then of an injectable study, um, a combined injection study. And it was halted early due to concerns over the prevalence of side effects. But actually on reviewing the study, of the 320 participants, only 20 people or around 6% of the study pulled out due to side effects. The Data Safety and Monitoring Committee recommended the study could continue, as did investigators and even men involved in the study, with more than 75% of participants reporting that they would be willing to use this contraceptive method again. But it was actually an additional independent body that determined the study should be discontinued. And that's had this quite... Um profound effect on the way that people talk about it in that the men in the study were being blamed for not tolerating these side effects when actually they were. Anecdotally, I've often heard people tell stories originating from this study that men became suicidal when taking contraception. And respectively, I think it's very important to also clarify that the study states the one suicide during the study was not related to the study regime. So that's one of the biggest kind of pieces of information is the way that that study has been reported and the actual facts of the study are completely misinterpreted by people at large. Then there's also the non-hormonal approaches. And that's because even after the testes has produced the sperm, there are other targets where we can try and intervene and stop sperm from being released. The next 
bit along the root would be in the epididymis when the sperm are being matured, there is a protein called epin, which is present on the surface of sperm in that time point. And that protein is only expressed in the male body in the epididymis on sperm. And so there are some promising drugs that are being developed that target this protein to stop sperm from maturing and moving properly. Then you also have the traditional barrier form of contraception that's already available. The condom which blocks sperm from being released has actually been around for thousands of years and was initially made out of animal intestines. I don't even know what to say. And then also the vasectomy. So vasectomies are permanent contraception. They are not considered reversible. And that essentially broadly is creating an incision in this greater drawing the vas, the tube that connects the testicle to the penis, out to the surface and removing a section of that tube on both sides so that the flow of sperm out of the body is, is blocked. But more recently, scientists have also been looking at promising ways to block the vas deferens, the tube that connects the testes to the penis, without cutting it. To essentially create a reversible vasectomy, so by passing a kind of gel or a polymer into the vas that then inhibits an emission or damages the sperm as they go past. There is exciting research that shows this has been extremely effective in monkeys, and recent preliminary human data from a phase one clinical trial has shown that it is safe in humans and significantly reduced sperm concentration and motility. So that leaves one question, how long will it take? Well, most research is still in the experimental stages, meaning it's either theoretical or has only been proven in non-human animals. But there is something that might genuinely be around the corner. Scientists report promising results for an innovative form of birth control for men. It's a clear gel. It's applied daily to a man's arms and shoulders. Um, you just open it and then you would squirt it out onto your hand and just start applying it to your shoulders. Yet not a pill, a gel. And both Professor Wang and Dr. Reynolds Wright are leading investigators in the current human trials. So it's got crystallized testosterone in it that can be dosed once a day, and then mesterone, which is a synthetic progestogen, which again can be dosed once a day, and those get absorbed through the skin. But why did the guys apply it will decrease sperm to very low levels, below one million, which is the threshold that you can enter contraceptive efficacy. Data about the safety of this gel is available publicly from the phase one clinical trial, and it's very safe. But data around how effective it is, is actually not available yet. So I thought I'd try my luck and ask both John and Christina instead. Are you able to share any preliminary data on its potential as a viable male contraception? We are not allowed to say. Can you share some preliminary data and how viable that seems to be? I can't because it is all uh, Embargo. But I wasn't happy. I couldn't just stop there. So I changed the wording of my question. How long do you think it will be until we, we have a viable product? I think it's realistic that we could see that coming to market within the next five years. So, you, so you're optimistic? Yes, yes, of course. After so of many course. years, yes. <laughs> When I started making this video, I truly wanted to understand what is taking so long. From a scientific point of view, why is there still no male form of contraception? But I unknowingly uncovered something bigger than that. This discussion is about the power of choice and how for decades, women have had to carry that burden almost entirely on their own. But today we're on the brink of something truly transformative. Male contraception isn't about shifting the responsibility or replacing what already exists. It's about sharing it, expanding the options for couples to decide together what works best for their bodies, their health, and their future. It's a new era where science is giving us more freedom, more options, and a stronger foundation for shared responsibility. And with that comes an opportunity to redefine what it means to plan for the future, not as individuals, but as equals in the most positive way possible. My name's Ash, a medical doctor working in London, and I create evidence-based medical explainers that help people better understand what's real, what's hype, and what the science really says about our health. Please make sure you subscribe to support the channel, and you can watch my previous video on how to spot whether a health influencer's full of shit here. Until next time, and see you soon.